Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon's edition of Brands at the Gate and with a new video update that we haven't had for a while. And we're really excited to be able to do this this afternoon because I've got here in the house a guest, Peter Schweitzer, who we've been trying to get to campus for a number of years. Peter Schweitzer is an author of numerous books, but he's really kind of a specialist at looking at at, at the intersection of government, uh, corruption, politics, business and and that nexus, which really helps us understand what really is going on with some of the things that uh, we see in the world. And his latest book is something called Blood Money. Why, and I might get the right thing, why the powerful turn a blind eye while China kills America. So today we're going to talk a little bit about this book as well as your previous books, because I think it's important for us to hear. So uh, Peter Schweitzer is a former fellow at the Hoover Institute, Uh, again, numerous uh, book publications, and now he's the president and CEO of the Government Accountability Institute. And so welcome, Peter. We're really glad to have you at Marines at the Gate today. It's great to be with you and to be here on campus. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. So, so to set the stage, I, I first became aware of Peter's work uh, about a decade ago because it was studying that aspect of political corruption and how it interfe- intersects with the, uh, the economic sphere and so forth. And what I was really impressed about was the I, that you really were not partisan at all. Mm-hmm. You hit Democrats, you hit Republicans. Talk about why that is so easy for you to find out, corruption well, on both sides. Well, corruption is not a red issue or a blue issue to pick the political colors It's really a green issue. It's about money. uh, And it's really embedded in the human condition. Uh, Anybody who says my side, whatever that side is, doesn't engage in corruption is not really looking at the fact that corruption is a profoundly human act. It's part of our fallen nature. um, And it's something that really anybody can succumb to uh, if they're not on guard. Um, I think when you look at political figures of whatever political party, it's a function of if they've been there long enough, um, the temptations get greater, and there's a sense of entitlement that develops in public service. So um, it's a bipartisan problem because it's a human problem, um, and it's something that everybody that goes into public service needs to be thinking about constantly. They need to guard themselves, uh, because if they don't, it's very easy to fall into that trap. Sure. Thank you. You know, uh, it's, you kind of would expect a thing, given the human condition, that we would have uh, some of the, our officials get corrupted. But in your work, w- it, can you think of what would be maybe the most shocking thing that really surprised you? I knew it was going to be bad, but maybe that's the, the worst thing that I saw. Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, there are a couple of examples. One would be uh, there was a senator um, uh, from Missouri, a Republican senator. I'm trying to remember his name right now, who uh, we were doing research investigations on politicians whose family members were lobbyists. Yeah, Roy Blunt. That's right. Uh, Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri. Um, And it ended up that he actually had four members of his immediate family that were registered lobbyists, his wife and three of his adult children. Um, That was kind of surprising to me. I mean, the the full family was engaged in this. And the problem, of course, as far as I'm concerned with that kind of an arrangement is that, uh, you know, uh, the firms are going or, or, you know, clients are going to hire the family members of politicians, not just to get the access, but now the family has has a financial incentive to see certain laws pass. Um, So that's a big problem. So that surprised me. But I think more generally what surprised me is the extent to which corruption has become globalized. Um, Mm -hmm. It's no longer a function of just a businessman back in somebody's home state who wants a federal contract and they give a shoebox of money to a politician. We're now talking about foreign oligarchs, um, foreign governments uh, that are striking financial arrangements with people from both political parties uh, and they're getting wealthy. These are adversarial countries. These are, are foreign countries that have you know, uh, ill intent towards the United States that have entered into these commercial ties with our politicians. To me, that's something that is uh, much worse uh, than the kind of domestic corruption that we've unfortunately become so used to. Wow. You know, when I read it, perhaps the most striking thing to me was the the circumstance you identified with uh, Speaker Boehner, oh, who, yeah. who was uh, in favor of a particular piece of legislation, and as the Speaker would have the power to bring it to the, the floor vote, but would not bring it until he had successfully uh, extracted enough campaign contributions for the Republican Party. I found that surprising. Yeah. They would slow roll a bill that they wanted to pass. Yeah, they call it the toll bridge or the toll road. Um, you got to pay the toll to actually, because the Speaker of the House, of course, again, whether it's Republican or Democrat, has tremendous power in a authority. Uh, If a bill, if they don't want a bill voted on, 
it won't be voted on, unlike the Senate, where a senator, of course, can introduce a bill and and uh, there's more latitude. So, yeah, that I think is a, a big um, a big factor. The other thing I think people sometimes get wrong on corruption is most people view it as kind of a model of bribery, right? It's the it's the good politician who gets tempted by the bad businessman. Um Sure, that does happen, but honestly, I think it's less the bribery model than it is the extortion model. And what sure. I mean by that is it's really the politician who is trying to create a demand for his services. If you're a politician and you sit on a powerful committee, uh, you want to make sure that people that want something from you pay attention to you. They can pay attention to you by giving you campaign donations, by hiring family members. So oftentimes there are businesses that they, they don't want to hire lobbyists. They don't want to give campaign contributions. They just want to do their business. But politicians kind of force them to get into that game. Um, so I think a lot of times... We let politicians off the hook. We blame the businessman too much. Uh, oftentimes, I think it's actually the politician who's extracting money, shaking down, as it were, uh, the businessman. Absolutely. Um, for some of my Berean uh, listeners may know, my, my PhD dissertation was on uh, what we called rent extraction. <laughs> and it was on political extortion. And, and it was not surprising to me that the data all worked out to uh, confirm <laughs> that hypothesis that we had. Uh, so, so yeah, we, we see that in Washington, D.C. a lot, where, where uh, lobbyists are given invitations, for instance, to come to, to dinners where they are invited to have an opportunity to purchase a table for other people. And it's well known if they are not there. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's one of the reasons why we see things like uh, the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee get larger campaign contributions than other relative committees that don't aren't able to influence, say, tax policy, which yeah. is out there. Yeah. And, and finally, and I'll let you comment on this if, if you've got any evidence or, or agree or thoughts on this. Uh, you know, I'm often asked about why it is as an economist when it's so clear, overwhelming, that the best tax system would have a, a f as few rates as possible, ideally a flat tax, with no deductions. And yet politicians that would know that that would generate revenue nevertheless like to have a very complex tax code and we ask ourselves, why would that be? But, but the answer I come up with, and I, I invite your comment, is that when you have a very complex tax code, you create demand for politicians to give you relief from said tax code. Right. And that's why we see continual agitation on that. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, one of the examples that, that's really stunning in this area is the research and development uh, tax uh, uh, credit or tax deduction that businesses get. And this is a very simple idea that everybody pretty much embraces, which is we want companies to invest in R&D and innovation. So they should get a tax benefit for that. Everybody agrees on it, but here's the problem. They never make it permanent. Mm -hmm. They only make it, you know, they extend it for three to five years. Why? Because all these businesses want it and the politicians know that they will give a whole new round of campaign donations. They'll do a whole new round of hiring, hiring lobbyists to extend it. So why make it permanent? If you make it permanent as a politician, you have less opportunity to extract campaign donations. It really is a, a, a crazy system that serves the political class rather than the entrepreneurs that really fuel the American economy. Well, if we haven't been discouraging enough, let's turn to your latest <laughs> book, Blood Money, uh, Why the Powerful Turn a Blind Eye While China Kills Americans. Outline just in broad strokes the two or three big issues that are in this book and, and help us understand why it is that our political uh, sector does not address this problem. Yeah, essentially what Blood Money argues is that China is at war with the United States. Uh, and don't take Peter Schweitzer's word for that. Look at what China actually writes about. They write about something called disintegration warfare. And the idea is we don't want to fight the United States in a kinetic or fighting war. Uh, we want to fight the United States without appearing to fight them. We want to seek ways to fragment and disintegrate uh, American society. Uh, and they're quite successful. Um, the subtitle of my book is pretty blunt. Uh, why the Black Blind eye, why the powerful turn a blind eye while China kills Americans. They are literally killing Americans. The, the fentanyl a crisis that we have in our country claims 100,000 people a year. It's a leading cause of death for people under the age of 45 in America. As I lay out in the book, the Mexican drug cartels are really the junior partners here. It is the Chinese who are the senior partners in this effort. They control every link in the chain that leads to this poison um, killing Americans. And the, and the people that are dying of fentanyl poison overwhelmingly 
don't even know they're taking fentanyl. That that's what I think is so tragic about this. This isn't like, you know, heroin or cocaine where people are addicted and they know what they're doing to themselves. Um, and the question becomes, why do our leaders not want to confront this? Um, and I think there are really two reasons, broadly speaking, one, which is more general, which is if you accept the fact, if you f- accept the reality of what China is doing to the United States, it has to change our relationship. I don't mean that that we go to war, but it means you can't have a normal relationship where you talk about, oh, you know, let's do another cultural exchange. Let's do this needs to be the central issue of the relationship to have China stop this behavior. That's a that's a that's a heavy lift. And and there are unfortunately a lot of people in Washington who went there. They like the title. They like the job. They like the power. They didn't go there to to um, uh, have a heavy lift. So that's part of the problem. People are ignoring what what Winston Churchill called vacant eyes. They're staring at the problem with vacant eyes because they know the implications mm-hmm. Of, of actually having to do something about it. The more narrow problem is that we have political figures, again, on both sides, who have financial entanglements with China. Um, and what that does is it creates a point of leverage uh, for Beijing. So these political figures, um, if they were to say or do something to China on this matter that really angered Beijing, it would create deep embarrassment. It could create financial havoc in these powerful political families. So they are choosing to sort of look the other way. And I would argue avoid confronting this problem uh, because it would damage them financially and it would damage their reputations. I'm, I'm on a college university. You're visiting us today. Yeah. And uh, I'm really happy to have you here. But there are a number of uh, universities that are being influenced by Chinese money for cultural centers. Other, Do you have any words on that and how they try to leverage that kind of contact? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Uh, in my previous book, Red Handed, I looked at, at this uh, a problem and specifically at Yale University, but it applies to lots of places. And the challenge is, is that the universities are, are not being honest in reporting the donations that they're actually getting. Um, and so in 1965, the Education Act uh, uh, became law, and it requires universities, if you accept foreign donations, to disclose those to the Department of Education. Uh, that rule has not, that law has not really been enforced. And what they do when they do actually disclose it is they they sort of um, misrepresent where it comes from. So, for example, one of Yale's biggest donors is a guy named Joe Tsai, who's the co-founder of Alibaba which is the Amazon of China. Uh, He's very uh, pro-CCP, Chinese Communist Party, uh, and he's worth $20 billion. Uh, He has ties to Yale University. He gives a lot of money to Yale. But when you look at their financial disclosure about foreign donations, you realize they're getting a lot of money in their disclosure form from um, uh, uh, from an island off the coast um, of um, the UK. Um, And you wonder, well, why is Guernsey... Um, listed as this major donor. Well, that's because this is where Joe Tsai has his tax shelter domiciled. So Mm. they are disclosing that they are getting a donation from Joe Tsai, not by name, but by location. But they're not actually showing the actual origin of where that money's coming from. So that's the first problem is the, the lack of disclosure. The second part is that university administrators will admit, and I quote them in the book, that that a lot of the Chinese money comes with strings attached, and it does change the environment on college campuses. There are students uh, that have a Uyghur background. That, of course, is the um, one of the minorities in China that's oppressed by the government. Uh, Uyghur students would say that they were discouraged by university administrators talking about the issue out of fear that it would offend uh, donors that were giving money to Yale. So it's an enormous problem. They're often strings attached, and universities need to uh, uh, not allow the money to silence the debate on campus um, because that should not be the role and certainly they should not let the levers of money determine who has a voice. We on this campus uh, a couple years ago uh, showed uh, the the video that was out on the story of Jimmy Lai and how the Chinese have uh, really uh, been uh, on the attack to put him in prison and to really stamp out any pursuit of freedom in Hong Kong. 
And so, so uh, one of the reasons why we want to do it was to show our students that this world still has a lot of dangers foreign uh, policy-wise. So, so you, could you address that broader issue? It seems like today in America, people want to think it's, it's, it's just about us. It's just right. about maybe the border, and we may not even see how other factors are influencing the border. Uh, do you think we can afford to just look internally at, at the stage of our uh, nation? No, we can't. And we need to understand uh, how China operates as opposed to adversaries we've had in the past. I mean, I'm, I'm a child of the Cold War. And uh, during the Cold War, you worried about a nuclear exchange. You worried about uh, there being a conventional fighting war with the Soviet Union. That's not China's play. China is actively doing things that are killing Americans, that are sowing social division in this country. It's active and it's ongoing. So we're not talking about a war being fought in a far off land that doesn't affect us. We're talking about things that are destroying lives, killing people and causing social havoc in our country. We have violence in the streets in America. Uh, obviously, you know, part of that is, is, you know, what's happening in the country and I would say moral decay. But China's fueling that fire by things that they are doing, smuggling in devices that are given to criminal gangs that turn handguns into machine guns for example. This is all intentional to fan the flames to cause more internal strife in the country. So when you talk about China and you talk about the threat to China, we're not talking about something that is 4,000 miles away. We are talking about sometimes things that are at your doorstep. And that's what I think people need to grasp. It's not theoretical. It's real and it's happening now. Wow. Thank you. My last question. Why is this important for Christians specifically to be aware of these kinds of things? Uh, it's a great question. I think we, uh, we're called as Christians uh, to seek the truth, obviously the truth with a capital T in terms of uh, God's plan, but I also think understanding what is going on in the world around us. Um, you know, the reason that some of the earliest universities uh, formed were Christian universities is the notion that we should be aware of what's going on in the world because it affects our lives, it affects the people that we love. Um, and so I think we have a duty and obligation to understand that, uh, and I think it also gives Gives us an opportunity for people who are, you know, b b feeling fearful, who have suffered a loss because of the consequences of some of these actions, to better understand and empathize people with some of the issues that they're dealing with. So, it's not just about understanding policy and what American policy should be. It's actually the way we conduct ourselves individually as Christians too that I think is important. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for all your work to help us understand the way the world really works. And, and you don't just have to trust P Peter. You can read his book and find this well-sourced with plenty of citations that you can go out and independently be a Berean yourself and see, is this reality or not? And unfortunately, I'm afraid that much more of this is true than I would like it to be. But get your copy of Blood Money. And if you're in the area, you can uh, come to Cedarville, Ohio tonight to hear him talk to our students. So thank you, Peter Schweitzer, for being in Berean's at the Gate. Thanks so much for having me here.